Good afternoon. Thank you for coming to the New America Foundation. I'm Peter Bergen. Uh, it's really uh, a great pleasure to uh, welcome Daoud Hatak, uh, who is a, a long-term friend of ours, uh, my wife. Uh, Daoud was uh, actually my wife's escort around SWAT during 2009 when uh, the Taliban were running free in SWAT and uh, kept her safe. And for that, I'm very grateful. Um, and uh, Daoud and I have known each other for uh, several years, and uh, this is his first visit to the United States, his first visit to Washington, and his first public event uh, in America. Uh, so we're really thrilled to have him. Uh, Daoud is a uh, veteran journalist in Pakistan who's worked for uh, the Daily Times and the News, which are the two best newspapers in Pakistan, and now works with Radio Free Europe as a senior editor at Radio Mashal, which is their Pashtun service. Uh, he's a frequent con contributor to the AFPAC channel, which is a something that the New America Foundation does in combination with Foreign Policy magazine. And we're really thrilled to have you here today, Daoud. Uh, he's also the George Clooney of the Northwest Frontier Province, as uh, <laughs> in case you hadn't noticed. Um, and um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> <You're totally kidding. laughs> and. Uh, and Dao is going to make uh, some remarks for uh, you know, uh, 10, 15 minutes. Um, I'll ask him some questions, and then we'll open it up to everyone here. So, Dao. Uh, thank you very much, Peter, and uh, New America Foundation for honoring me to address this house. And thanks to my RFERL colleagues for their efforts organizing this event. And good afternoon to all of you. Uh, I would like to go through my writing because so that I may save the time and then I'll uh, give more time to them for questioning and all these things. So, uh, as Peter mentioned in his opening remarks about my journalistic careers in the region, about uh, both Afghanistan and Pakistan and now in Prague-based Radio Mashal, I would like to share my experiences and the very local perspective from the my coverage zones. But before going ahead with that, let me say a few words about Radio Mashal. Uh, this is a Pashto language uh, radio from Prague with nine hours live transmission from 9 a.m. in morning till 6 evening Pakistan time. Radio Mashal target audience are the people of Fata and uh, rest of Pashto speaking people and the purpose is to provide unbiased and impartial information uh, to the people who are living in almost information darkness. This, in our opinion, can help the Fata people to have an understanding of the situation and decide what is going on and what is bad for them and what is good for them. Uh, in my opinion, in the past few years, uh, VOA, Diva Radio, and Radio Mashal did considerably uh, very good uh, on that front. Uh, returning to my topic, drones, militancy, and uh, negotiation, uh, I would like to discuss all the three briefly and uh, First, I will go to the negotiation part uh, of my uh, piece. All of you are well aware of the situation, and there is no need further explaining the fact that uh, Pakistan and Afghanistan are so closely intertwined that anything happening on one side of the border is leaving its effects on the other. Seeing in this context, uh, one can easily draw the conclusion that what is going on and what future scenario is building in Afghanistan will have its effects on Pakistan, and what is happening to Pakistan will influence the situation in Afghanistan. For that reason, questions are being raised about the peace negotiations with the Taliban, with the Afghan Taliban, I mean, uh, from the Pakistani side and the future of the people of er and areas where various Taliban groups are holding positions, and in recent years, uh, those Taliban groups have proved uh, more dangerous than their Afghan counterparts. The key question is, uh, what will be the future of Pakistani Taliban if the Afghan Taliban agrees to enter an agreement uh, with the international community and the Afghan uh, government? Uh, two very common but uh, contrasting views from the ground. The Pakistani Taliban would lose the pretext to continue their fight mainly because their source of inspiration is the Afghan Taliban leadership and slowly and gradually lose their support base among the people of Fata and rest of Pakistan. Uh, but there is uh, another view and uh, against this optimistic view, this is very optimistic, 
there is another theory, and that is the Afghan Taliban may propagate any future compromise as a victory, uh, which could encourage the Pakistani Taliban to double their efforts to arm struggle for Sharia-based system of government or some sort of share in the Pakistani government, just on the lines as their Afghan co counterparts will be getting in case the peace negotiations are uh, uh, succeeded. Still, one more important question is about the very peace negotiations uh, and the possible outcomes. Even if there is an agreement and the Taliban join the Afghan government and accept the Afghan constitution, uh, which seems unlikely at the moment, uh, how it will affect different ethnic groups and their differences, which are the products of decades of war? Uh, what will be the future of warlords uh, who are as strong as ever before and still having strong support bases among their respective areas? Can the Afghan government and leadership will deliver better than now and till now, till how long the system could continue with a weak economy? Afghan army and foreign interference are other key questions. Excuse me. Now coming to drone strikes. The negotiation process uh, has a connection with the drone strikes in Pakistani tribal areas. The strikes have no doubt eliminated some key Al-Qaeda and Taliban operatives and denied them the opportunity to run training camps or operate openly. However, it is also a fact that the attacks are being exploited by the militants and they are like-minded as well as some political parties to foment anti-Americanism and expand their support base among the Pakistani masses. Information from the ground whatever is available, suggest losses both to combatants and non-combatants. Apart, uh, apart from the other parties supporting one side or another and the official viewpoint, the tribesmen, mostly those affected by the ongoing militancy, military operations and the drone strikes, want an end to the war, uh, be that through peace talks or use of force. I would like to use this opportunity to dispel a common perception about the tribal people that they don't want change or they are against development and reluctant to send their children to schools and instead like to be at madrasas to, be, to, to make them jihadis. I'm saying this on record that the vast majority of tribesmen are in favor of education for their children, mostly boys and a little less percentage uh, regarding girls' education. They want political reforms in their areas and they want political activities. They want development schools, health facilities, better communications, and access to information. And here I would move to the last point of militancy. There is very common view where poverty, uh, illiteracy, social injustices, and uh, backwardness are mentioned as uh, some of the key reasons for the spread of militancy in the tribal areas and rest of uh, Pashtun parts of Pakistan. Uh, no doubt those are some of the reasons, but one can question that the level of poverty, illiteracy, backwardness was higher in 30s, 30, 40, or 50 years ago. Uh, but the tribal areas were never seen posing threat to peace in Pakistan or any other part of the world. The tribal people might have their internal fights, uh, they might have their internal feuds, uh, and they might have uh, their arms, their love for arms, but all this was restricted to their communal life and that never came out to disturb peace in rest parts of the country. Much so, even during the Afghan Jihad, when the gun culture spread to many parts of Pakistan alongside the uh, tribal areas and the Taliban regime, the tribal people stayed quite peaceful. Uh, but comes 9-11 and the tribal areas uh, started becoming the hot zones for all types of uh, militancy. Uh, isn't it better to blame the policies of the successive governments for the present state of affairs uh, of the tribal people who I may say were made to support militancy uh, instead of directly blaming them? Means instead of directly blaming the tribal people. To be brief, the options for the government and the international community are very clear. Tribal people want to be part of uh, the mainstream uh, they are as social as uh, people living in other parts of uh, Pakistan. They want positive change in their life. They want education, health facilities, roads, dams, jobs, and so on. 
Unfortunately, not, nothing of their sort is visible on the ground, uh, and the social status of the tribal people is uh, rapidly going down, mainly because of the ongoing militancy operations and displacement uh, from their areas. Their houses are destroyed, their children are living in tents in hot summer and cold winter, and the displacements snatched from them the meager resources of their income, whatever were available in their respective areas. I don't believe someone can expect a positive change in this uh, situation. Last word, uh, the world and the government in Pakistan needs to focus on their genuine needs and demands instead of making them scapegoats in this anti-terror war. Uh, I know uh, I, I left many uh, unanswered questions and I leave it to my audience. They can ask and I would try to the best of my ability to reply to your questions. Well, thank, thank you, Daoud. Uh, a couple of things I just wanted to mention about Daoud's uh, biography. He was born in Ashwara in uh, what used to be the Northwest Frontier Province, which is now Khyber Pakhtunwa, um, and has spent much of his career in Peshawar. Um, he wrote, a, uh, I think, the best paper on SWAT uh, for the New America Foundation, uh, the, what happened in SWAT over the last uh, two or three years. Uh, also, I think quite unusually for a Pakistani journalist, he worked for Pajwok, the Afghan news service. I think it's very unusual for a Pakistani journalists to work in Afghanistan. I can think of perhaps maybe one or two. Uh, um, so just in terms of some questions that I had, Daoud, the first one is um, basically in the coming election, do you, um, do you think ordinary political parties as opposed to religious parties will be able to campaign in the tribal areas? And, do normal political activities? Because I know that they've been banned for many years from doing that. Yeah, uh, after years of uh, uh, living under the frontier crimes regulation under which the political activities were banned in the tribal areas, now finally in 2011, the government, the central government of Pakistan extended the Political Parties Act. And for the first time in the history of Pakistan, uh, in the upcoming general election, which is uh, scheduled to be held in March, uh, somewhere in March 2013, the political parties will be going in the tribal areas. But as for your question, uh, looking at the security situation uh, in all the seven tribal districts, uh, it seems, uh, if not impossible, so it seems uh, difficult for them uh, to continue their political activities in the tribal areas. Yes. Uh, the ground is uh, uh, quite uh, favorable for the uh, religious parties, but uh, when I'm looking at this political situation in Pakistan right now from here and when I was there last November, uh, so the political parties uh, are also one way or another. Uh, they are trying to extend their branches to the tribal areas and hopefully there might be some political activity but not on that level. As it, is, uh, uh, as it will be or as it is happening in the rest of uh, Pakistan. It will take a little more time and a little more security measures to ensure that political activities are taking place in the tribal areas. Do you think um, it makes sense for the tribal regions to become part of what used to be the Northwest Frontier Province, now Khyber Pakhtunwa, to make them all so that they have the same rights uh, that everybody else in Pakistan has? And there well, isn't this artificial sort of distinction? Yeah, the, recently this is a very uh, interesting debate uh, after the extension of this Political Parties Act uh, in Pakistan. This has become a very interesting debate. Uh, some of the tribal, uh, you know, very encouraging thing is coming forward. Uh, I would like to add a few more words. Sure. Uh, the uh, tribal political parties are taking shape hmm. now after the extension of this Political Parties Act, new tribal leaders are coming forward, mostly from the younger generation. Are and these they sort are, of secular nationalists, or what are they, what is their... Uh, if they are not secular nationalists, at least they are not religious parties. They are not attached with religious parties. They are somewhere in the middle. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so these, these people are coming forward, and now uh, a debate is uh, developing that whether the tribal parties should be part of Khyber Pakhtunkhwa or it should be a separate uh, uh, province. Uh, uh, then uh, uh, the Awami National Party, which is now in government in Khyber Pakhtunkhwa, it is uh, in support of uh, uh, merging the tribal areas uh, in the uh, Khyber Pakhtunkhwa to become a separate province. Uh, 
although there is some support from the tribal people, uh, but still uh, a large number, uh, I would not say more than this uh, because uh, no one can say for sure that exactly how many people are supporting uh, this, but still uh, some of the tribesmen and the tribes people, they want their separate province. Although there are some, some technical province uh, for having a separate province for the uh, separate province, making FATA a separate province. There are like some technical province, just for example, uh, the tribal belt is like, it's a long line. It's a cow line like this, a long cow. And if you are making it a uh, separate province, so they are thinking that what can be the center for this mm. long cow? Where can we establish? Because the most developed tribal district is Khyber. Uh, tribal agency. But uh, coming someone from south or north Waziristan to Khyber tribal agency, it will, talk, it will take him a long time and uh, waste of time and resources and everything. So now the, all these things are uh, being discussed and still it is not clear uh, what uh, will be the future of the tribal areas. What's your assessment of Pakistani military activity in the various seven tribal agencies? I mean, the, obviously in 2009, the Pakistani military delivered a defeat to the Taliban in Swat and a defeat to the Taliban in southern Waziristan. Have those defeats sort of held? And uh, how would you assess operations in Khyber, Moman, Bajor, other places? Uh, that's a very good question because I was in the middle of some of those operations when I was covering it, particularly SWAT and this in the last operation in October 2010 in uh, South Waziristan. When I'm looking uh, at the operation in SWAT, the situation was really very bad and I think everyone sitting here who is following the situation there, they might know about the what was going on in SWAT because Taliban uh, led by Mullah Fazlullah he is also known as FM Radio, uh, FM Mullah because of his FM uh, uh, transmissions. <laughs> he, his men uh, captured the whole of the, almost he uh, paralyzed the whole of the uh, SWAT machinery, the administration. And uh, when the Pakistani uh, security forces uh, uh, acted against him, so they were successfully expelled uh, from the SWAT region. Although the uh, tribal, the, the Mullah Fazlullah, he miraculously, he escaped uh, the military operation and now uh, the Pakistani side uh, says that uh, he is somewhere in Kunar or Nuristan province of Afghanistan. So, so far the SWAT operation uh, is concerned. Uh, it was really uh, very successful and the Pakistani security forces uh, did a really very good job uh, at the expense of a lot of lives and uh, financial losses. South Waziristan uh, is uh, also successful to the extent that the clear phase is uh, already uh, there, but uh, there is clear uh, hold and then handover. And then after the handover, I would say that there is a rebuilding phase. That is the more necessary thing. When I'm looking at SWAT, clear is okay, uh, hold is okay, uh, but it needs, there are some things need at the rebuilding phase because the rebuilding process is there, but it is uh, very slow. And now it is the, uh, I would not say this is the job of army, this is the, this is the job of uh, civil administration to do uh, the rebuilding phase. In Waziristan, uh, they cleared the area and the Taliban, uh, they fled from and they dispersed in dif different areas and they are still holding it. Uh, but uh, uh, the people are still displaced. They are living in tents uh, since uh, 2010 uh, in the nearby cities are on the periphery with uh, South Waziristan and North Waziristan. And they are unable to return to uh, uh, their houses because they have no trust uh, in the uh, peace process and they are, they are fearing that uh, someday the Taliban might return into their area. So this operation, I would say this is partly successful, although I would again say that uh, they did a, a, a very good job because the, looking at the terrain in South Waziristan uh, and then conducting a military operation against an enemy which is local and which is uh, sitting there and which has support bases uh, from some of the local people, it's uh, really uh, difficult. There are other operations. Uh, uh, I would not go for an operation in Bada tribal region, uh, which is going on since uh, 2007. Uh, 
uh, and still it is a tiny region uh, though very difficult. Uh, but uh, uh, the people are displaced uh, since 2007 and they are living outside the area, the people are living under curfew. So, uh, somewhat this operation is uh, a kind of uh, failure. Pakistani security forces might have their own reasons because they are saying that they have lack of resources and they are far stretched, too much far stretched and their forces are in engaged on the border and, uh, uh, and different tribal agencies like in Mumand and uh, in Oragzai and in Koram tribal agency, there are sectarian clashes. So, um, I would say they did a great job, but still more is needed to ensure, to, to get the confidence and to get the trust of the people in the security forces and so that the people believe that, well, peace is returning to their areas. What kind of military operations are the Pakistani military doing in North Waziristan, do you think? Uh, in North Waziristan, I would say uh, military operation is not going on there. The military is present there, but uh, uh, they are uh, in a sort of uh, an unwritten agreement. Uh, with the Haqqani uh, network? With, with, with some of the uh, Taliban network, not with all of them. Because after uh, expulsion from South Waziristan, these uh, Taliban groups, they dispersed into different tribal areas. Because after the South Waziristan operation, uh, some of them spread to uh, Aurakzai agency, some of them spread to uh, Koram agency. And uh, then the Haqqani network, as you uh, said, it is already there in North Waziristan agency. So if uh, uh, if the, uh, uh, I would not say that they are in a kind of agreement, uh, but uh, as we are following all these things, so uh, we can say that at some, at some point, somewhere at some point, there is a kind of complacency uh, which is uh, uh, showing and like a direct action is not going against the uh, Haqqani network. Because they would be too hard to take on? Because... Of course, they are uh, very strong and uh, their network is uh, there since uh, 2001. So, uh, at a time, uh, Pakistani, force, Pakistani security forces and their government also have a valid point because at one point, taking on all the Taliban groups uh, in South Waziristan, in Khaybar, in Muman, then in other parts, and then you are taking on uh, Haqqani network, a strong network like the Haqqanis. Uh, of course, it's uh, a little bit different. Typical. Well, we've got 150,000 U.S. and NATO troops in Afghanistan, and they haven't had uh, total success against the Taliban. Mm. So I think the Pakistani argument that, yeah. uh, that they're stretched thin is not, uh, you know, has some merit. Um, well, let's throw it open to questions. Uh, for, if you have a question, can you raise your hand, wait for the microphone, and identify yourself? My name is Malik Siraj but I'm a journalist. Can we turn the microphone on? Okay, maybe you just need okay, to. Okay, I can listen. Can you hear me? Yeah, <laughs> I can just for, the, for our I audience okay, on right. the web. Yeah. I'll speak loudly. Yeah. <laughs> yes, okay. Eric, can you tell them? Thank you. Go ahead. My name is Malik Siraj Akbar. I'm a journalist from Balochistan, currently working with the National Endowment for Democracy, as a Reagan and Faisal Fellow. Uh, my question to you is about the future of the TTP and also about the future of Al Qaeda in, in the region. Uh, considering the fact that the entire concept of jihad mushroomed in the 90s because they looked at the disintegration of the Soviet as a uh, defeat of the so-called infidels, and right now, again, there's a debate over, you know, the, the American uh, defeat in the region, for instance, they look at America withdrawing from the region in 2014. Now, has you talked of, like, negotiating with them or in terms of giving them a pretext? In 2004, they had an agreement at Shakai, then they, with Afiz Bahadur. Then they had an agreement like with Naik Muhammad, and even the Pakistani government like granted them amnesty. But we realized that even neither talks succeed with uh, the TTP, nor can the Pakistani military defeat them in terms of applying uh, uh, you know, military strikes uh, consistently. Uh, so how do you see the future of TTP? What will like TTP suffice with? And secondly, do you think with the end of uh, bin Laden, it's the end of Al Qaeda in that region? Thank you. And, and just to formulate the, so the question is essentially that there have been a number of peace agreements with the Taliban in Pakistan before, all of which they've basically um, abrogated. Uh, thank you, Siraj. Uh, uh, and uh, uh, I wish to clarify one thing because I did not say that uh, talks with the uh, Pakistani Taliban. When I, was, when I was saying that talks with the Taliban, so I meant that talks with the Afghan Taliban. 
because in Qatar, in Qatar, uh, but I am coming to your question. In Qatar, talks are going on with the Afghan Taliban. So I was, uh, uh, my point was that if this talk succeed or if there is failure in this talk, so what will be its impact on the Pakistani Taliban? But I am coming to your question anyway. Uh, for Al Qaeda, I will say something, but I think I would refer it to Peter because he is expert on Al Qaeda. <laughs> but I will go for that. Uh, for uh, the, the talks with the TTP, uh, first of all, TTP is not uh, uh, a, a, a tightly, uh, a, a tight organization with the, a full uh, organized control and having a, a very strong leadership. You can, if you are following the news, uh, only yesterday, uh, I think on Friday, there was a statement from the uh, Tehriki Taliban spokesman, Esanullah, and he said that they have expelled the uh, deputy uh, chief of the Hariki Taliban, Fakir Muhammad, who does not belong to South or North Waziristan. He is not a Masood or he is not a Wazir. Instead, he is from Bajawar Tribal Agency. So he was expelled from the TTP. This is, uh, this, this is showing a kind of rift among the Taliban. And even today, he was interviewed by Reuters news agency. I was reading a news while I was coming here, so uh, uh, I saw a news. And uh, Fakir Muhammad told the uh, Reuters news agency that I am still in support of talks with the Pakistani government. Can I have yeah. a lot of sure. now, Who do you think is micromanaging the TTP? The ISI or the uh, Mullah Omar network? Who micromanages? I think TTP is uh, managing itself. Uh, 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 if, if you say something, if you make it very uh, like, uh, it's not so simple to say that this is the ISI and this is the Mullah Umar thing. They may have some kind of is inspiration and they may, may, may be getting some support at some level uh, from some people. As former President Parvez Musharraf said on record that uh, they might be getting some support from some retired army, army officers or something like that. But uh, uh, so far I cannot say and I'm not in a position that it is directly supported by the ISI or directly supported by Mullah Umar. Yes, from Mullah Umar they are getting their inspiration, but they are not part of the uh, organization of Mullah Umar. They are not part of the uh, Afghan Taliban because their agendas, their works are totally different. The Afghan Taliban are not, sub, are not uh, attacking the Pakistani security forces. They are not attacking the Pakistani installations. But the TTP people, they are going after the Pakistani security forces. Secondly, you will never heard that after 2005 or 2006, because I was there in Afghanistan, and you will never hear that after 2005, 6, when Mullah Umar declared that you are not going to destroy schools. Then destruction of schools was totally stopped. But you can see in Pakistan, 1,300 schools were destroyed in Swat district in less than four months. Uh, Dozens of schools uh, and I would say scores of schools were destroyed in Khyber tribal agency, in Muman tribal agency. So they are different from each other. The Pakistani Taliban are using their Afghan links, Mullah Umar, as a pretext to draw support from the people. And they are saying that, well, there are uh, NATO forces, there are American, they captured Afghanistan, this is a Muslim country, and we are going to wage jihad against them alongside the Afghan Taliban, and we are part. This is why they are getting the support. When I presented two theories before that, and when I said that, uh, one theory is that if there is a sort of compromise, there is a sort of settlement in Afghanistan. So the Taliban will automatically lose their support base in Pakistan because right now they are using this pretext that we are going there and we are fighting our jihad against Americans and blah, 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 our NATO, our ISAF troops. So, and uh, coming to Al-Qaeda, uh, I think uh, uh, after, uh, uh, after the killing or before the killing of Osama bin Laden, Al-Qaeda network uh, in uh, Waziristan uh, was, uh, uh, was already on the uh, back foot and uh, um, I would not say that there are not, no, no civilian casualties in the drone strikes, but I, I, I would give my credit to the drone strikes because they did the job uh, up to some extent uh, against the uh, Al-Qaeda figures. And after the killing of Osama bin Laden, uh, their morale has further gone down in the cities the Pakistani security forces are tracking them. And if you, go, if you go through the past history, you will find that a lot of uh, Al-Qaeda leaders were arrested from Mardan, from Faisalabad, from Karachi, from Rawalpindi, from different cities, and the Pakistani security agencies arrested them. 
but the drone strikes did their job in the tribal areas which are which are difficult for the pakistani security forces to reach there so my conclusion will be that al qaeda is on the back foot it is not that much strong as it was uh, a year or two or three before you know, just, uh, Doug, perhaps you could talk about the TTP, which, of course, is the acronym for the Pakistani Taliban. I mean, give us a sense of um, who their leadership is, to what extent they're under the command of control of Mullah Omar. You said that he provides inspirational leadership. Um, how many men do they have? Uh, what are their competing agendas? Some have done peace deals with the Pakistani government, which uh, some have not. Uh, give us a sense of uh, their strength and um, their weaknesses. Uh, as for their strength, uh, mm, uh, the TTP, uh, the total number of uh, uh, Taliban, uh, I, I would quote the figures of uh, uh, 2008, though no one can say for sure that this, this many figures, this many Taliban are there, this many, because they are also switching sides, they are changing someone, are uh, stopping fighting, because no one can say that this person is a Talib and this is not a Talib. Right. And then the uh, tribal areas are inaccessible. One right. cannot reach there, so uh, it's really very difficult to get the exact information. But uh, while I was in Peshawar in 2009 and I was writing something, so I talked to uh, an expert on these uh, Taliban, Brigadier Mahmud Shah. I was sitting with him and we were discussing something and he presented me some figures that uh, the total number of these people, but it is 2009 figures, the total number of these people, including the Al-Qaeda figures, including the foreigners, Chechens, Uzbeks, uh, Tajiks, uh, uh, then from Chinese sides uh, and from uh, the Pakistani Tehrik Taliban, the total number he mentioned me 12,000. Seems low. Yep. They, they, it is. Because the low. Haqqani network has got to be several thousand right there. Uh, Haqqani network, you see, Haqqani network is not, okay, their base is there in North Waziristan, but they are, they are, they are going forth and back. Right. And sometimes one cannot differentiate that what, what, what is the uh, difference between uh, uh, Afghan Taliban means those who are uh, under Mullah Umar and the Haqqani network. They are mixing but, up. By the way, I, I want to just throw out an idea. That, I mean, I, I, this idea of the Afghan Taliban, I think we should sort of abandon it. I mean, every Taliban uh, leadership figure lives in Pakistan, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> and they don't recognize the border. I mean, it's a kind of, it's a distinction that works very well for the Pakistani government to say that there is these different kinds of Taliban. Um, there's the Afghan Taliban. I mean, the, the, it, at the end of the day, this is a really Pakistani phenomenon, and we're kind of buying into some, uh, I think, an artificial distinction. I mean, obviously, there, is, there are differences, uh, but uh, the Afghan Taliban doesn't really live in Afghanistan. The leadership is all in Quetta or Karachi. Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Taliban, uh, I, I would agree with you, Taliban are uh, Taliban, but then uh, the uh, Pakistani side and the Pakistani media are uh, using this uh, uh, name of uh, Pakistani Taliban for them. Uh, and uh, if we uh, look uh, at the situation, so there was no Pakistani Taliban before the 9-11 uh, or before the uh, uh, situation right now, what is happening in Afghanistan. Uh, these Taliban, they, they, these Taliban emerged after the uh, uh, the attack uh, of the invasion of Afghanistan, uh, and uh, then they formed their groups, and then they, in 2004 or five, I think they formed their own. 2007, uh, uh, correct me if uh, I am wrong, but it was 2007 that they formed the umbrella organization, and they named it as the Tehrik Taliban Pakistan or TTP. Uh, as for the uh, border, so yes, uh, they are not recognizing the borders, but uh, uh, then the Afghan Taliban are recognizing the border. <laughs> they are not crossing into Pakistan, yes, for their shelters and for their houses, but they are not waging their jihad in Pakistan. So far, right. yeah, only their focus is on Afghanistan. They are coming for rest to Pakistan and they are staying there and they are having their, maybe they are having their places there, but still they are more focused on Afghanistan. As a reporter reporting on the Taliban, uh, do you talk to Najibullah, the Taliban spokesman? Do you talk, who, do you, who do you talk to to get reliable information? Uh, who does Radio Mashal talk to uh, in terms of like getting confirmation of what the Taliban are saying or doing? Or 
Do you, are you reading their websites? What is a useful source of no, information? Uh, actually, we are not uh, directly talking to any Taliban leadership or any Taliban spokesman or anyone. Uh, yes, uh, Taliban are uh, not their Taliban which were in 2001 or before 2001. They have their Twitter accounts, they have their Facebook, and uh, uh, they, are, uh, they, they, they are following the media within seconds. Uh, if you publish something. And do you find the Twitter stuff to be uh, accurate, the stuff they're uh, putting out? Even we are not using their Twitter stuff. Yeah. We are not using their Twitter stuff, but, but just we are getting an idea that what, what, what are their views and what they are saying about this particular issue and this mm -hmm. particular thing. So how do you get confirmation about, you know, let's say there's an attack somewhere uh, in Pakistan by mm -hmm. the Taliban. I mean, is it, do they usually take credit for these attacks? Yeah, Afghan Taliban are not uh, calling our reporters, but the Pakistani Taliban did. Yeah, so yeah. they will call you and... Yeah, they call our reporters uh, and they say that we are claiming responsibility for this or that attack. And one final question before we open it up. It seems that um, the level of violence in Pakistan is really kind of declining pretty uh, sharply. I mean, the number of suicide attacks is down somewhat significantly. Um, why do you think that is the case? Uh, if you compare it to 2009. Yeah, it, of course, if we compare it, it was horrible. 2009 was uh, every second day or third day there was attacks and there were a lot, uh, there were huge number of casualties, both civilians and militaries. It was the year when even the uh, Pakistani uh, GHQ, the military headquarters, were attacked, uh, was attacked in Rawalpindi. Uh, so uh, if we compare 2009 with the... 2011 and 2012. So yes, I would say that uh, uh, there is a considerable decrease. Uh, and uh, But uh, right now, uh, only a week before, uh, something suddenly flared up in uh, Peshawar and one attack, another attack, and then the FC personnel were kidnapped and they were killed. So kidnapping and FC personnel, five for 15 and frontier 20 Frontier Corps personnel, and then kidnapping them and then killing them. So. Mm, these, uh, on one hand, this is showing a signs of uh, uh, Taliban weakness, that they are, uh, uh, they have been weakened by the military operation. For example, Swat was cleared of Taliban. Uh, Bajor Fakir Muhammad is already in talks, and or at least he says that he is in talks with the Pakistani, uh, Pakistani government. So he is not... Uh, uh, staging any attacks. He is not carrying out any attacks. In Moman, the Pakistani security forces conducted some operations and the Taliban were already weak there and they are now on the back foot. The only area uh, where they are, uh, in, in Aurakzai, I will come to, uh, uh, to Kuram uh, tribal agency, uh, uh, Taliban leader uh, Fazal Saeed Haqqani, he was part of the Tehriki Taliban Pakistan, but he defected and he uh, announced his own uh, group Tehriki Taliban Islami Pakistan, TTIP. So this is again another blow to the Taliban. Uh, so far they are strong uh, somewhere in South and North Waziristan Agency. So uh, it, it shows that, uh, uh, it shows the weaknesses uh, after the military operations and their command and control structure is a little bit uh, uh, dispersed. And this is why they are not carrying out that much organized attacks as they uh, used to carry out and uh, 2009 or in the first half of 2012. Uh, would you, uh, the second part of your question. Actually, you know, one last thing, you, the Punjabi Taliban, do mm -hmm. you remember, do you, what are, who are they? What do they do? Well, uh, the Punjabi Taliban, uh, this is uh, <laughs> becoming a, a very uh, like attractive terminology now in media. Uh, they are mostly uh, groups, uh, they include groups. Uh, which were at one time uh, Kashmir focused. Then there were some uh, sectarian groups uh, like uh, Sepahe Sahaba and uh, uh, the Kashmir focused group like uh, Jeshi Muhammad of uh, Molana Masood. So is it kind of like an umbrella term that the Pakistani media uses for these groups or is it something different? No, it's, it's different. But uh, collectively they are called the Punjabi Taliban and this terminology mainly came out from Waziristan because the people used to call them Punjabi Taliban. The rest of the Taliban were Pashto speaking and they were Urdu speaking, so they used to call them Punjabi Taliban and it came right. out and slowly, slowly it reached to the media and now it is commonly used as Punjabi Taliban. Can you wait for the microphone? Yeah. 
Eileen uh, Sereo. I uh, I'm really very interested in going back to the point you you made in the start about the fact that there's no you know the borders are not of course I uh, recognized uh, the and at the same time what we're seeing is a in some ways a, a dissolving of the strengths of the Tal of the Pakistan Taliban, but it seems to be flowing into other organizations. They've just mentioned the uh, Punjab Taliban, and it's becoming, it's sort of morphing into things. And, and so as we see things ebbing and flowing in Afghanistan towards, you know, two steps forward, one step back towards a peace process, which we hope will eventually be seen at some level in some way, and the established vision of what was the Pakistan Taliban now losing its original thrust to support, and it's the Afghan Taliban. Do we see it being absorbed into efforts in Baluchistan, efforts in other parts of Pakistan to it, for groups that are looking to carve out their own interests, uh, for outside efforts that want to make sure that Pakistan stays destabilized. How do you see this playing out? So, I mean, would, I mean, I guess one form of that question is, um, could the Taliban be, uh, you know, become part of the Balochistan resistance, or is that unlikely? Are they, you know, as, they, as their power ebbs, are there other ways in which their energies could be focused? Means on another areas like Balochistan? Yeah, Balochistan or anywhere or other parts. Well, uh, Taliban have their most uh, powerful arms of support is uh, their jihad. And if you remove jihad from something, so then people will not be, certainly they will not be supporting the Taliban and their agenda, and they would not be able to draw as much support from there. Uh, as for Balochistan or some areas, so this is a totally nationalist uh, uh, struggle in Balochistan, uh, nationalist fight in Balochistan, and it is uh, not related in any way to the uh, Taliban uh, situation. So, uh, 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 yeah, I think. Okay. In, in back here. To the main question of uh, drones, as you said, the FADA people are quite fed up with the militants as well as uh, what's going on with the drone strikes. But in case they are, which I'm sure they are, uh, you know, fed up with the militant activities, spoiling their own social, you know, sort of infrastructure there, are they in a way sort of pleased also with those drone strikes that, you know, they, they, are, they are sort of eliminating these elements from within their territories? Do they welcome them in some way that, you know, they are, they are sort of uh, achieving the result that they would want that militants leave their areas? So, I mean, the, I, the locals, are they happy about the drone strikes? Is that the question? Apart from the that they, they face, uh, right. Are they happy about the yeah. Uh, about the locals. And, and the, their views of the drone strikes. Yeah, uh, the locals, uh, you know, as I said, that uh, there are civilian, civilian casualties. And, of course, uh, these drone strikes are... Uh, fomenting some sort of uh, anti-Americanism, and uh, it's providing a pretext to the Pakistani political parties and some Islamists uh, to say that, well, uh, a foreign power is here in Afghanistan, and they are, uh, they are violating our sovereignty and uh, our borders, and they are conducting drone strikes. So uh, it's, a, it's a kind of uh, uh, anti-Americanism is there, and uh, it's also uh, giving some credence to the Taliban uh, jihadi uh, agenda in Afghanistan and also against the uh, Pakistani government. But so far, the civilian uh, views are concerned. Uh, I think the uh, the, the the ground uh, situation, uh, it, because no one can reach there, so it will be uh, a little bit difficult to say for sure that, yes, the civilians are totally in support of the drone strike or they are totally against the drone strikes. Uh, but uh, as far as I talk to some people for my own stories, so uh, some people are, I may say, a lot number of people that I met, they say their drone strikes are okay and they are doing their jobs unless they are not targeting the civilians. 
wherever civilians are targeted, then the people are saying that these drone strikes are against the, uh, they are violating. And about this, uh, I, I would go to another point. This is, uh, uh, my idea is that uh, if the Pakistani government and the uh, US government, and since they have partner, they, they have coalition partners in this anti-terror war, if they share the correct information from the ground and if they release the names of the target of the drone strikes, like this person, he was a Taliban, he was from this area, and he was killed in, that, uh, drone, in this and their drone strikes. Once you are releasing the exact information to the people, I think it will snatch the opportunity from some Islamists or political parties to say that, well, only civilians are being killed. So uh, 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 I think people are uh, in support of, because people are also suffered during the uh, military operation. And obviously, it's, it's happening every year when military operations are being held. So uh, civilians are, uh, their properties are damaged, and uh, they are killed. And what is happening in Afghanistan, uh, like uh, we are seeing that all the times, uh, or sometimes uh, the uh, NATO forces in their air bombing, they are targeting sometimes civilians, sometimes the Afghan police. So this is happening in Pakistani side, and this is also happening with drones. Uh, but as for as they are targeting the Taliban, the local people are happy with it. Yeah. Hi, my name is Tara McKelvey, and I'm a correspondent for Newsweek and the Daily Beast. And you talked about the political parties and their, um, what they say about drones. I'm wondering if you can talk, tell us about Imran Khan and how he's used that issue. Uh, <coughs> coming to Imran Khan, uh, I was reading something about Imran Khan's speech at a public gathering. And uh, uh, he was telling the people that uh, 90% of the people who are, target, who are killing, who are being killed in these drone strikes, they are civilians. So uh, I would not agree with that uh, statement. But still, uh, it is because of the name of Americans and the drones, uh, the, the names of Americans attached to the drones. It is providing a sort of uh, uh, support base for Imran Khan to say that, well, these drone strikes are violation of, and not only Imran Khan, other parties are also uh, exploiting this situation in the name of drones. Even the Pakistan People's Party, and this is the Pakistani style of politics, even the Pakistan People's Party, which is now in government, if tomorrow it's going into the opposition, you will see that it will be opposing the drone strikes. But today they are silent and they are saying that, well, everything is going well. So uh, I would say that this is a, a, a sort of point for the political parties, and not only the drone strikes, but anything, everything that is happening there, they, they, they want to catch that opportunity and to use it for their political gains. The back. Uh, Taha Gaya with the Pakistani American Leadership Center. Just from briefly reading the kind of introductory materials that they provided, it seems that Radio Mashal is, you know, provides fair and balanced news coverage. Do you think but from a U.S. perspective, do you think that the U.S. should actually have some kind of de-radicalization message, or should there be a message? Is there some kind of messaging to the Pakistani people that you think would be effective in terms of maybe winning some more popular support, or you know, doing some kind of de-radicalization program, or even increasing the amount of awareness of U.S. aid projects in Pakistan? You know, if you were to create a U.S. message, how would you? What would that message be, and how would you get it out there uh, you beyond? You mean radio machine? Sorry. Uh, you mean you you discussed radio mashal like through me, radio mashal? No, I'm, I'm not. General proposition: How would you? Is there a message that can be the United States can give to de-radicalize Pakistan or make the United States more popular or other actions the United States can take beyond just providing yeah. fair and balanced news reporting? <laughs> well, uh, I think uh, if you look at the Pak, uh, uh, the history of uh, Pak U.S. relations. Uh, so I would say, unfortunately, uh, most of the time, uh, there were the military governments. And uh, uh, they invested most of the time in uh, uh, military rulers. Like the last one was uh, General Parvez Musharraf, and he ruled for 11 years, 10 years. Uh, I, I, I would question that how much investment is made in the Pakistani civil society and the Pakistani political leadership. I think the best uh, uh, strategy for the US uh, uh, would be uh, 
this is a kind of suggestion for me because I don't know much about the US policies there on their side. Uh, but the best uh, strategy would be to focus on the civil society in Pakistan because the civil society after the, uh, this media revolution in Pakistan, it's becoming vibrant and uh, yesterday I was, I was showing a news piece to uh, Peter and it is really uh, encouraging. This is uh, uh, a civil society group. They uh, organized a protest demonstration against some banned jihadi groups in uh, Peshawar. This is for the first time that I was uh, uh, reading this news item. Uh, so if we, we, they can get a very uh, good chance if they come close to the civil society uh, uh, in Khyber Pashtunkhwa, in Punjab, and in other cities of Pakistan. And uh, I think in this way they can, uh, they can spread and they can give a very positive message. And in this way they can, uh, though it will be a long term, it will, it will not, uh, I will not say that it would be in a month or in a year, it will be a long-term planning and it will uh, show some positive results. Great. Any other questions? What do you, go, go ahead. Uh, hello, my name is Nasir Khatak. <coughs> uh, I'm a American from Pakistani origin, concerned citizen. <coughs> it, it seems like uh, there's a mess there in the it's confusion uh, between different groups. Um, different groups mean? Uh, Haqqani Network, Pakistani <laughs> Taliban, Afghani Taliban, Quetta Shura. Yeah. <clears throat> and we put these labels on, uh, in, in, on all these groups, <clears throat> which are not really organized. And we don't even know the exact numbers and who's supporting who. <clears throat> Maybe they are foreign powers. Where are they getting financing from? <clears throat> so it's a, a big confusion to me, <clears throat> you know, from just a concerned <clears throat> person there. So it must be challenging how to sort through all those uh, different groups. <clears throat> in, in that situation, um, the mistrust between the U.S. and the Pakistanis, the governments, and how they're handling it, how important do you think that is <clears throat> to solve this because, for example, if the drones strikes would be done jointly, <clears throat> that would take away the sovereignty question and um, <clears throat> um, Pakistanis could, you know, take credit for it. For example, even if capturing of, of, of Osama bin Laden would have been done, you know, jointly, that would not have started the, the current rift between the Pakistanis and the U.S. <clears throat> so how important do you think is the trust and to build that trust between the administrations uh, to tackle the challenges? <clears throat> and how can we build that trust? Uh, thank you, Khadak. Uh, confusion is, uh, I think confusion is the main force in all these things. No one knows that what is happening there. I think it's not true about Pakistan. Uh, uh, no, I'm sorry. Not about the general <laughs> I mean, but about the Taliban, <laughs> that who is supporting what, who is doing what, who is following home policy, and uh, where are exactly they are getting their uh, uh, finance uh, resources. And no one can say for sure that this is happening, this group is supported by this one, this group is linked to this one. Okay, can when we interject here, because this, you often hear this about, from in Pakistan about the foreign forces, which is really a code for the Indians supporting the Taliban. Yeah. Is there any evidence for that? Uh, we have seen so far no evidence as far as Pakistan and uh, India are concerned. If there is some evidence against each other, so they would instantly brought it to the media that, well, India is doing this or, well, Pakistan is doing this. But so far, no country, Pakistan, so far, no one provided some. Uh, although some, uh, some during SWAT times, I heard some spokesman, he was saying that, well, they are supporting, uh, they are getting support from India at their time. But after that, I never heard this, that thing. It wouldn't make sense because the Taliban regard Hindus as, you know, the worst forms of heretics, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, but Hindus are laying far away from, they are on the other end of the Pakistan because they are in Waziristan and this is on the eastern border. So it's a long distance for them to reach there. Right. <laughs> they are now focused on the near uh, areas, which is Afghanistan. Uh, and uh, so, uh, 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 Nasir, about confusion, I think no one can say for sure that why all this confusion is there. Uh, uh, I would excuse myself. But this confusion is the real force of Taliban. <laughs> because there is a circle after every circle, and there is a shadow after every shadow. 
and you are always going in those circles and in those shadows. Uh, as for the trust question, of course, uh, if there is a trust, both countries are partners in the uh, anti-terror war coalition. Uh, uh, both countries, uh, like uh, if something, I, I said if something is happening bad in Afghanistan, so it will, it will definitely have its impact on Pakistan and we are seeing the same. Uh, this is the 30 years of war in Afghanistan and we are seeing the same situation in Pakistan. Just go back to 80s and 70s and we are not seeing any kind of Taliban or any kind of militaristic acti activity or any kind of uh, uh, some unrest in the tribal areas at this level as it's happening now. So uh, it, it, they, both of these being coalition partners, they need uh, the uh, trust, they need trust of uh, each other. But in the past 10 years, uh, all the times, uh, this trust is... Uh, um, receiving shocks and the last shock was in the form of uh, my two incident in Abbottabad. So uh, I pray for the trust to be restored to the old level. Great. Good afternoon. Uh, Urmila Venigopalan from Jane's Intelligence Review. Uh, my question is, a lot of observers of extremist violence in Pakistan believe that the epicenter of militancy in the country lies in southern Punjab and that what we're seeing in the tribal areas um, is, is largely a symptom and that even if the TTP and other such groups, if their potency eases over the next couple of years, militancy will always remain a fundamental problem to Pakistan given the strength of the jihadi infrastructure in southern Punjab. Um, so I'd like to hear your views on um, on that on that analysis of extremist violence in Pakistan. Thank, thank you. you. Uh, thank you. And uh, in southern Punjab, uh, yes, of course, there are uh, uh, some jihadi groups uh, which are uh, uh, mostly uh, Kashmir focused. Uh, they are operating from there, and they are mainly uh, exploiting the uh, widespread uh, poverty. Uh, in southern Punjab, and uh, uh, there are the uh, sectarian groups. Uh, they have their centers there, and these sectarian groups are then uh, going to uh, where uh, uh, DG Khan and all these mountains, and uh, uh, they are having their uh, strong bases. Uh, in uh, then again, th they are they are having their they are uh, uh, they are they are having their crop ready from the south. Uh, Punjab district, and then they are shifting them to uh, south uh, and north of the to be uh, used as their uh, sanctuary. So I agree with you that uh, the problem also existed in uh, uh, southern parts of uh, Punjab. You know, these um, southern Punjabi militant groups, is there any evidence that they're doing deals with the political parties there? Uh, yeah, uh, I think last year there was uh, uh, some reports uh, that uh, provincial minister uh, in Punjab, uh, uh, he was, uh, uh, it was reported in the media that uh, uh, his gunmen are uh, from a banned uh, militant organization and uh, his name was Rana Sanaula, uh, I would quote him, uh, and it was reported in the English Pakistani media. Uh, but uh, and uh, at one point, uh, uh, the government of Punjab chief minister he asked the Taliban, uh, "We are not opposing your agenda, so why you are attacking us?" But to say that they are getting some support from them, I think uh, I, I would not say that they are getting active support from the government or Punjab or any. But uh, the Punjabi government isn't taking these groups on. Uh, so far, not. Right. They're pretty large. These groups. Yeah, the, these groups are mainly in southern Punjab and they have their bases there. Maybe they are uh, stronger, but the Punjab government, uh, uh, you know, political experiences are always there in Pakistan. So Punjab government might be thinking that it can create, uh, uh, it can disturb situation for them, uh, particularly when the Pakistani elections are coming. So, Right. Any other questions? Over here. Um, my question is regarding the economy in the local areas. Um, how do you believe the people who are being radicalized in the area, especially children in madrasas, how do you think that the benefiting the economy or helping 
um, via trade and industry in that area. How do you think that would help? Or is that even uh, like a goal in the short term? Uh, means economy in the whole of Pakistan or no, only in, in the tribal areas? Oh, in the tribal areas. In the tribal areas, of course, uh, uh, one of the reasons, one of the many reasons is the widespread uh, poverty in the tribal areas. Uh, the youth are uh, uneducated, uh, uh, the areas are backward. Uh, when I when I was saying in my initial remarks that uh, over the years, like from 1948 till now, uh, one cannot say that uh, how many big hospitals are constructed in the tribal areas. None. Uh, how many big road projects are existing there in the tribal areas? You cannot say that there is a big project. Uh, how many educational institutions are there? Uh, like. Uh, uh, engineering universities, medical universities, nothing is there. This, they, they have uh, almost uh, 7 to 8 million population uh, there in the tribal areas and uh, it's covering a long, long distance. Uh, so if all these projects were there, uh, I think it might have some, uh, it might have some uh, effect and uh, the situation would not uh, uh, go to uh, uh, that extent. All, this is one of the reasons. I would not say that this is the main and the prime reason, but this is uh, uh, poverty and uh, improvement in economy. It's one of the reasons. Any other questions? Thank you. A couple of questions on, on media uh, in, in Pakistan. What Where kind from, of, uh, Vasu Vaitla from the Department of State. Um, what kind of media pr is prevalent in the tribal areas? What are the uh, who's producing the newspapers, uh, the radio, yeah, the television? That's a good question. I would like more generally. Uh, actually, yeah. also more generally, uh, can you reflect on on Pakistani media in general? You know, here we talk about that it's riven with conspiracy theories. You know, what's the sources of this? You know, you have, you have people saying that the ISI seeds stories there. Uh, you say, well, no, Pakistani media is actually just a reflection of the opinions of the populace there, but or or there is a anti-American sentiment within the journalists themselves that 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 drives it that that frames the uh, uh, the United States for the populace. So general reflections on 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 how the Pakistani uh, media operates. I, I would first go to the media in tribal areas. Uh, uh, in the tribal areas, media presence is uh, equal to none. Uh, only two uh, radio channels, uh, radio stations are there. Uh, one is from Khyber Tribal Agency, another is uh, from, uh, uh, I think it is from Mirali uh, in Waziristan region. Whatever is produced by the radio station from uh, in Khyber Tribal Agency, it is given to the as it is to the Waziristan radio station and it is releasing the same thing. So, and these two radio stations are owned by the government. It is under the government control. So, then there is a local media. It is under pressure from the government. It is also under pressure from the Taliban because they are operating in the heart of Taliban and they cannot give uh, reports or information uh, that is unbiased or that is totally uh, impartial or what is the demand of the tribal people regarding news and information and views. Uh, uh, so uh, uh, I would say that uh, international broadcast in the past few years, uh, uh, VOA, DUR radio in the past six, seven years and now Mashal supported by Mashal, they have, they, they have almost 18 hours transmission in circle. Mashal starts at nine in the morning, it continues till 6. When we are finishing, then Diva comes. Diva comes, it starts and it continues till 12 in the night. In this way, they are covering the whole time. And they are competing the uh, TV, they are competing the uh, television, they are competing the Pakistani newspapers, and they are competing uh, other media, magazines, and all these things. So, so far these two uh, 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 international broadcasts is there, BBC broadcasts are there, it is only 20 minutes for Pakistan. So, uh, I would not say that it's doing uh, really uh, very well. Uh, BBC Pashto. BBC Pashto, yes. Do you, have a, do you have a sense of how many people in the tribal regions are listening to your programming? Or is it impossible to tell? Uh, uh, on the basis of our last uh, service, uh, uh, I'd not... Uh, I'd be wrong if I caught some figure, but uh, it was some 8.4 percent people mm -hmm. are listening, and yeah, mm -hmm. and right. uh, in order to uh, make our programs interactive and to invite the people to come and join us and have your voice in our programs, because the Fata people they are voiceless, 
they have no representation in the media because there is no media and if there is no media then no one is going there to uh, uh, to, to, to present their problems to the people. So, we are including them, we are making our programs interactive to include them and then they are uh, sharing their voices with us, they are calling us, they are joining our live debates, they are joining our uh, feature programs and then our reporters are reporting on their problems. So, uh, so far these two uh, radio stations are doing a good job. Recently, uh, only a month before, I heard that uh, someone has started a newspaper from uh, South Waziristan. Uh, but uh, you would be amazed to listen that this newspaper is reporting only cultural news. Why only for security reasons? Because if the newspaper goes here or there, then there will be uh, some sort of reaction. Uh, so this is the situation, uh, uh, media, TV is, is for the TV, uh, like there is a kind of revolution in television in Pakistan. But uh, tribal people first, uh, there is poverty, no one can uh, afford to uh, have a cable network. Then there is energy crisis in Pakistan, no one can watch a TV for all the time. Uh, then there is the Taliban fear because they are saying that uh, this media and uh, TV and television, this is against Islam and you are watching all these things. So uh, then TV don't have, uh, TV is also not there. As for the rest of the Pakistani media and the uh, conspiracy uh, theories, uh, I would partially agree uh, with you that uh, there are conspiracy theories and sometimes there are rumors and uh, in search of breaking news, uh, they are uh, highlighting some issues which, are no, which is no issue. But they are making an issue of that. Um, I would tell you a joke because uh, I was watching a TV and they were uh, having live transmission on a, uh, on a buffalo. It was filled in a well and they were having a live transmission on a buffalo. That well, a buffalo fill in a well and we are having, our reporter is there on the spot and we are having a live <laughs> coverage of that. So <laughs> it was very interesting. But still, uh, 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 I, I would come to the job of the Pakistani media. Of course, it did a great job. Despite all these things, despite all the negative things about the media, it created a lot of awareness among the people. Although sometimes it is misguiding and uh, taking the people here and there, but still awareness is coming in the Pakistani society about the governments, about their problems, about their rights, about women's rights. Uh, so I think, uh, and with the passage of time, maturity will come as it is coming in the Pakistani political parties. I think that's the biggest change in Pakistan in the last uh, 10 years, probably, right? The, the fact, you, you know, if you went to Pakistan 10 years ago, you turned on the TV, it was Pakistan TV, it was mm. government propaganda. Now I think there are 89 channels, yeah. uh, many of them anti-Taliban, many of them anti-American, many of them pro-democracy. I mean, there's a lot of... It's, uh, and, and the Pakistani, I think, media itself is becoming uh, much more mature. There's a lot of, you know, there's some very good journalists in Pakistan. But it's not, it's not a quick process. It cannot be possible if we say that, well, it will be in a day or month. It's a slow process and it's a gradual process. And if it continued, I think. Uh, to the point you've just made about uh, the 8.4%, uh, uh, it says in your piece here, the high proportion of female, uh, there's a high proportion of female listeners. Uh, what kind of questions do you get from the female audience? What is the, what is the concerns? What are their issues? What are their concerns? What is, what are they voicing to you? Uh, yeah, uh, we are, uh, we are uh, framing our programs in a way uh, so that uh, it is of some interest for the listeners and for our target audience. Either they are uh, female or they are uh, male. For example, I will give you the example of our health programs, Radio Mashal Health Program. It is a live debate for 30 minutes. We are inviting a doctor and he is uh, telling the uh, people uh, about their health problems because in, because in Fata, in tribal areas, uh, I think many of you would know that uh, what is the situation of health facilities in the tribal areas. And then listening the voice of a doctor that a doctor is speaking here, a lot of people are calling us, although the calls from Pakistan are very much expensive for them. Sometimes they are talking, talking and the phone cuts up and we believe that, well, their balance was finished. <laughs> so, uh, and apart from that, we have music program. Now, in our health program, 
we are sometimes touching issues which are taboos in the Pashtun society. We are saying, okay, a woman is pregnant. Why should not you take her to a doctor instead of treating her at home? And then these families, the girls, sometimes they are calling us from, we have calls, we have record of our calls from Aurakzai tribal agency, we have record of our calls from parts of uh, Balochistan, the most, uh, uh, like, uh, I would say the backward areas mostly. The, and apart from that, very interesting for all of you, they are participating in our music programs. Yeah. My colleague Harun Bacha is sitting there and he can tell you better. He is having a music program uh, from, uh, for Mashal and he is a very uh, famous, uh, he is a celebrity and he is having a, a program and some people are calling him uh, and uh, girls are calling him and they are asking, well, we want a, this, this song, we want that song. So they are, and there are very, uh, several other programs. We have our feature program for women, especially for women, for those women uh, who who are having some sort of achievement in their life. Its name is Palwasha, means array, uh, array of light, array of light. And it is particularly focused on women and girls. And recently when the Pakistani uh, uh, Sharmin Ubed, uh, yeah, won the Oscar. when she won the Oscar, and just before winning her Oscar, we interviewed her. And we got a lot of uh, comments and a lot of views uh, from our listeners. And uh, we are again trying to interview you know, her. Uh, female audience. literacy rate in the tribal regions is 3%, which I think must be one of the lowest, if not the lowest, in the world. So obviously, being able to communicate yeah. via radio is important. Mm. Um, any other questions? Well, in which case, we will thank Daoud for a very rich presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.